This is a 2002 Go 4 Interceptor 2, better known as a meter made car. Yes, that's right. You want to see me review the Cybertruck or the Bronco Raptor or the new Corvette Z06, but instead, I'm going to give you the world's most thorough review of a meter made car. So let's get started. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bins, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era, now with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And you should, because we've had some great sales recently, including this electric Hummer pickup sold for $235,000. This fantastic 80 series Land Cruiser sold for $33,000. There's a lot of interest in the 80 series right now. And this wonderful Sprinter van sold for just under $50,000. We do great with vans and camper vans on cars and bids. So if you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. Check it out at carsandbids.com. So let's do a quick overview on this. In case you aren't familiar, people drive these in urban areas to patrol the streets and check for parking violations. And they're a common sight in big cities throughout the world. This is a mid-engine vehicle with a center driver's seat like the McLaren F1. Unlike the McLaren F1, it's powered by a Hyundai four-cylinder. Now, like I said, this is the Go 4 Interceptor 2, and it is very different from the Interceptor 1. <laughs> Let me just tell you. Now, also, I mentioned this is powered by a Hyundai four-cylinder. It is mid-mounted. This has a single seat and three wheels. Obviously, it was previously used for parking enforcement, but now it is privately owned by a true connoisseur here in the San Diego area. He's on Instagram as that meter made, and I will link his profile in the description below so you can follow along for meter made car adventures. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Go 4 Interceptor 2. <laughs> the meter main car by discussing the keys. Inexplicably, even though this vehicle is approximately the size of a washing machine, it comes with four different keys. One key, this one, unlocks and locks the doors. You have doors on either side and locks on both sides, and this key does that. The next key, that unlocks and locks this little storage area under the seat in the interior. You get a separate key for that. A third key unlocks and locks the trunk in the back, which I will show you more later, and a fourth key, that's this one, is the actual ignition key. Now this is a regular Hyundai ignition key from this era. This one's been duplicated, but this is what they look like. And it makes sense because, like I mentioned, this has a Hyundai powertrain. So four separate keys for four separate locking and unlocking areas in the meter made car. But anyway, next up we move inside the meter made car. And this is where the fun really begins. I'm going to start with the steering wheel, which you can see is a Hyundai steering wheel. Now, it's important to mention this vehicle is not manufactured by Hyundai. It's actually made by a Canadian company called Westward, but they were using a Hyundai drivetrain, so they just took Hyundai parts. They didn't even bother to change the Hyundai logo on the steering wheel to their own logo. They just kept the Hyundai logo which kind of gives you an indication of the quality of this machine. Now, other Hyundai parts in this area, you have a Hyundai turn signal stock, as you can see here, just looks like a regular car signal stock from this era. You have a Hyundai windshield wiper stock over on the other side, as you can see here. You do have intermittent wipers in this, which is a very nice luxury for the Interceptor 2. But possibly the most interesting Hyundai item in here is the gauge cluster, which was pulled straight out of a Hyundai vehicle. Now, I say it's interesting, especially because of the speedometer, which goes up to 120 miles an hour, which would have been a relatively normal top speed on a speedometer for a Hyundai from this era, but not for a meter made vehicle. You can't possibly go 125 in this. In fact, the owner tells me that when this was new, it was governed to 25 or maybe 35 miles an hour, wouldn't go faster, which meant that like 75% of this speedometer was completely unusable. 
because the car couldn't actually go that fast. And speaking of the speed situation in this vehicle, it gets more hilarious. There is a little light to the right of the steering wheel labeled governor, and that would turn on if you were getting near the speed governor to let you know, hey, you're taking things a little too fast in the Interceptor 2, you better slow down, your governor light would let you know that. But anyway, since I've already moved on to the dashboard, let's talk dashboard controls in here, starting to the left of the steering wheel with this dial, which adjusts the fan speed for the climate control. This is a Hyundai dial, just like the rest of the stuff, and you can twist it and that will turn on the fan in the interior. But let's say you don't want the fan on, you're driving this thing around writing parking tickets and you're cold. You need some heat. Well, this little lever here you can pull out and that turns on the heat. When you have the fan running, you pull out this lever, the heat goes on, and it warms you inside the cozy cabin of the Interceptor 2. <laughs> And there's more climate control than just that in this interior. To the right of the steering wheel, you have a little latch. You pull that out and it turns on the defroster. So if you need to defrost the windows, you can do that with this little latch and with the climate control on. And there is a very helpful diagram explaining how a defroster works right below that. You can see it's a decal with some crazy lines pointing up. <laughs> <laughs> that That is their explanation of what a defroster does in the Interceptor 2. And there is so much more than that to discuss in this interior. Continuing on with the dashboard, directly below the steering column you have this little rubber piece here. That is a pen holder, which is very important if you're a meter maid writing parking tickets, you gotta have a place for your pen, and so it is prominently included right in the center of this whole interior. Now next to the left of the steering wheel, you have your hazard light button, which you can see here. Interestingly, this is mounted upside down from a typical hazard light button, where the triangle is pointed up, and I think they did that because they wanted to put this little decal on it that says hazard, and if they had mounted it the correct way, that decal wouldn't have fit, as you can see, because the button comes to a point at the top. So they just flipped over the hazard light button so they could put on their little hazard decal and it would actually fit. Again, high quality manufacturing for the Go 4 Interceptor 2. But anyway, let's move on to some other controls on this dashboard. To the far right, you can see two little switches here. One says rot and the other says work. The owner's not sure what those do, but he thinks they control lights, like light bar lights on the outside. The thinking is that rot maybe stands for rotating if there's some sort of rotating flash flashing light, and then work is some sort of other light, and you could turn those on using those little switches. And speaking of exterior lights in the Interceptor 2, you also have this little control panel on the left side of the dashboard, which you can use to turn on and adjust one of those sweeping lights that tells people to go around you. You can see, use this dial to adjust which way it tells people to go, and that way you're moving slowly in one lane writing parking tickets, people can see and go around thanks to this little control here. And there's still more in this interior. Back to the right side, this little circular gauge shows your engine hours. Your odometer is in the normal spot in your Hyundai gauge cluster. And you can see about 45,000 miles in this vehicle, which sounds horrible. But engine hours is down in this little gauge, and it also shows you how many hours the engine has been running, which is an important thing for a vehicle like this, since a lot of idle time is done that isn't reflected in the odometer. But probably the craziest thing on this entire dashboard, maybe in this entire interior, is this panel on the right that is marked Lateral Thrust Indicator. <laughs> You would think this is something you would find in like a Bugatti, your lateral thrust indicator for racetrack laps. But instead, it's right here in the meter made vehicle. And what this does is it alerts you if you're taking a corner too fast. You see, this isn't the most stable vehicle in the world. And so if you're going too fast around a corner, you might tip over. To prevent that from happening, this lateral thrust indicator will beep and actually light up to let you know if you're cornering too quickly and you should slow it down. <laughs> which is incredible. Not really something I've ever heard of in any other vehicle, but they don't want people to get injured driving these while doing their public service. And so you have a lateral thrust indicator in the meter main car.
But anyway, next up, let's move on from the dashboard and the steering wheel area, as interesting as those things are, and let's talk comfort. For one thing, you have a nice dome light in here. You can see, you tap this little button and it turns on a nice warm mood light, which is nice to have in the Interceptor 2. But then we must discuss the seat. There is only one seat and it is center mounted, just like the McLaren F1, a center seat driving experience. The most interesting part of this seat though is the fabric that is on it. The owner of this vehicle thinks that it's the same fabric that was used in various city bus interiors throughout the 90s and early 2000s and it really is hilarious. There are all these little designs integrated into the fabric that are almost something but not quite something. Like that almost looks like an animal but it isn't quite an animal. These little colorful designs that aren't actually of anything but instead just serve to make the fabric a little more interesting than your regular seating fabric. <laughs> Very 90s look, and it is kind of strange to see it. But anyway, speaking of comfort, important to point out that the Interceptor 2 used an automatic transmission. The gear selector is mounted to the left of the seat. You can see it here, and this is just a regular Hyundai gear selector from the late 90s and early 2000s, and you can use it to shift into gear, park, reverse drive, just like a normal car gear lever. You also have a parking brake located here, of course. You pull it up and turn on the parking brake. Pretty simple. But anyway, next up, over on the other side of the driver's seat, you have a couple interesting items. One, this little white lid. It flips down to reveal a cup holder, which is a very nice amenity in this vehicle. Also, once you have this lid down, if you look back into this compartment, you can see there is a 12-volt outlet there, like a cigarette lighter-style outlet like you have in a car, which you could use, I guess, to charge devices or power stuff while you're driving the meter-made vehicle. Now, interestingly, above that compartment, you have a little padded armrest which is a nice luxury and it comes up but only to here and you can't lock it in that position. <laughs> I have no idea why this is hinged or why this works like this but it does one of the mysteries of the Interceptor 2. And next up, our last interesting item worth discussing in the interior, that would be the doors. Like I mentioned before, there is one door on each side, which makes it easier to get out on either side when you're writing your parking tickets. And the doors operate in kind of an unusual manner. They slide open, as you can see, or you can just slide the upper half open, the window part, and keep the door closed. And that would allow you to reach out and place a ticket on a vehicle, or maybe just get some airflow in here, you could basically slide the windows off and cruise around in your open air interceptor too. And that's actually facilitated even more because the rear window also opens. It slides open just like a pickup truck. So you could have your door windows slid back and your rear window slid open and you'd enjoy all the comforts of a nice breeze. Except the owner tells me that sliding back the rear window, actually not the best idea because the engine is right back there and when you open the the rear window, you just get fumes in the interior. But anyway, next up, let's discuss the engine, which is located in here, under this cover. You open this up and you first reveal a large cargo area. Unusually large, massive in fact, given the size of this vehicle. It's just huge. I guess this is where you would put all of your parking ticket writing supplies. But as large as this cargo area is, it does share this space with the engine. To access the engine, you pull off this white panel here, this white metal panel. It's like an engine access panel. Pull it off and there it is, your engine. You can see the Hyundai brand logo on the top proudly announcing that this is powered by Hyundai. This is a one liter four cylinder and the owner told me when it was new, it was probably making around 60 horsepower. So not exactly a big engine and not exactly a lot of performance. Then again, this thing doesn't really need a big engine or that much power because it only weighs about 1,500 pounds. It is tremendously small and relatively lightweight, and it's really only going to be used in city driving, writing these parking tickets. The owner also told me that back when this was new, it probably got around 50 miles per gallon, which makes sense given the small, lightweight vehicle and the small engine. Now, as you can see here, removing this panel doesn't really give you access to a large amount 
of the engine, just sort of the stuff on top. If you want to do more servicing to other parts of the engine, you have to remove more. But basically, this entire vehicle is kind of removable, and you can pull everything off and really get at the entire engine if you want to. But you can see with the engine here, this is indeed a mid-engine vehicle, and it is rear-wheel drive, just like a true sports car, mid-engine rear-wheel drive. Although the owner told me he thinks that this powertrain is just a front-wheel drive engine that they flipped around backwards and stuck in the meter made vehicle. So it's not really a supercar, but it has the same basic idea. Now, one other difference between this and most exotic cars is this only has three wheels, two in the back, and one up front. Yes, that's right, just one wheel in the front of the Go 4. I guess they deem two to be an unnecessary luxury and expense. It's right here in the center, and you can see it from the front of the vehicle. You just kind of look lower, and there's the wheel. But if you want to service it, well, you can do that through this panel here. You unscrew this panel, and you can pull it off, and that gives you access to the front wheel. As you can see, there it is in all its single-centered wheeled gold. You can also see some other servicing items in here, like the wiper motor, various fluids, and some other stuff you might need to access in case you have to do some servicing on the Interceptor 2 from the front. Now, also up here, a couple of other interesting items. One, Go 4 is printed massively in the front bumper of this vehicle. It's almost like they were trying to show off the brand name to people who saw this on the street, as if anyone might look at it and say, ooh, Go 4. Now, that thing is something I really want. Now up here you also have a couple other things. Headlights, you can see, I believe these are from a mid-90s Hyundai Sonata, but I haven't checked that yet, but they are from some sort of regular car, and they look a little out of place on this strange, tiny, three-wheeled vehicle. You also, up here, have a bull bar. You can push people out of your way with your mighty Interceptor 2. This metal bull bar looks like something an off-roader would have, but this has it. Now the owner tells me that this bull bar was an option in this vehicle. Apparently there were options, and this was one of them. Other options, in case you're curious, on this and newer Interceptors include air conditioning, which would have provided for a nice experience inside, and even a radio, so you could listen to music while you're writing people parking tickets. And indeed, you can still get those options today because this is still in production. There is a newer version on the market today. I believe the current one is the Interceptor 4, but it's still being made, just modernized, and with some nice new features and a sticker price of $26,500. Imagine spending almost 30 grand on one of these. But apparently, various city governments do exactly that for their parking meter enforcement. But anyway, since I'm on the outside, let's talk through some other interesting Interceptor 2 exterior quirks. One is the mirrors, which are absolutely massive. You have these huge rear view mirrors that are totally disproportionate with the size of the vehicle, but I guess it's important. You write a parking ticket, you want to merge back into traffic, you really want to see what's behind you since this is so tiny and you don't want to get hit. Although, if you do get hit, it's important to know that this vehicle is a roll cage. The entire thing is like a structural roll cage. You can see the roll bars on the outside, on the inside, and everything in here is designed to keep you safe, although of course that's relative because this is still an incredibly tiny vehicle and I wouldn't want to be at any serious impact in one of these. But but at least you're sort of protected with the roll cage and the bull bar. <laughs> And speaking of safety, it's important to mention that the Go 4 Interceptor 2 complied with all the seriously important safety regulations of its day. For instance, it has reflectors mounted on the side, front and rear, although they're just decals. You can see the orange front reflector is just a sticker they stuck on probably when production was over, and same deal with the red rear reflector. These aren't actually reflectors, they're just decals that have been tacked on there. I would expect nothing less from the company that inverted the hazard light switch. Now, speaking of interesting exterior cost cutting, how about the fact that the rail for the sliding door runs down the entire side of the interceptor, even though the door only opens to here. 
There's no possible way to use all the sliding door rail, and yet you have it. <laughs> Extra sliding door rail. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's what they decided to do. Now, in the back of the Interceptor, you can see on the bumper, printed in massive font, is the word Interceptor. Again, advertising to everybody precisely what this was. After all, it was Go For's pride and joy. Now, when this was new, of course, it would have had other decals on it, specifically in this case, decals cows for the city of San Francisco, because this was a San Francisco parking enforcement vehicle originally. Eventually it was decommissioned at some point in its life and passed down to various private owners. The current owner told me that he bought it from a guy on Nextdoor, the like neighbor's social media app, where he saw it for sale for like 700 bucks. And he's fixed it up a little bit, and he tells me that these are usually available at police auctions, where you can pick them up for like two to three thousand dollars, although I'm not really really sure why anyone would. All right, <laughs> driving the meter main car. This is absolutely terrifying. In the rain, it's just terrifying. The, okay, so the owner told me that this vehicle is governed at like, uh, I think I said 40, 35, 40 miles an hour, but he removed the governor. So this one, he told me, he set it up to 74 in this tight, three-wheeled, ridiculous, <laughs> absolutely horrifying. Uh, at that speed. Now, it's especially horrifying here in the rain. Um, you know, you're supposed to drive this at two miles an hour, checking people's, like, windshield registration and their parking meter va validation, you know? Like, look at, oh, two miles an hour, too. Well, here I'm going 20, right? And it's already a terrifying experience in the rain on three wheels. <laughs> Okay, first off, it's loud. You know, there's no intent made to try to sound deaden this interior because the kind of the municipalities who are buying this, they didn't care. It didn't matter. You know, they, it was a meter made vehicle for a function, a purpose. It wasn't intended to be comfortable or luxurious. And so it's insanely loud. It really does feel excessively loud and crashy in this interior. The suspension is just really, really crashy. You're not getting any compliance or plushness from the suspension in any capacity. Oh my God. <laughs> The steering is like kind of jumpy. <laughs> There's only one wheel and it's wet. And who knows the age of the tires. By the way, water is leaking on me. Not much, but some. Enough. <laughs> but the steering is a little jumpy. Like you, you don't have a lot of control. And when you when you do steer, I'm in 30 and trying to steer, you feel the front kind of start to go a little squirrely. Like it starts to pitch down a little, or it's it's unusually vague. It's it's very disconcerting. And now I understand why it has the lateral thrust indicator. Although I have not tripped it off yet. Oh my God, this thing is ridiculous. I think this would obviously be like just fine if you were using it as a meter made vehicle, but to drive it on streets. The steering is so questionable. <laughs> not, not because it's broken or it has a problem. I don't think that, but I just think it is questionable. Like it's a, it's a one, it's a single wheel, and it, it feels very shaky and awkward when you try to do any sort of steering with it. Low speed steering, it can handle just fine. Like that at like seven miles an hour, no big deal. But when you go in 30 and you're trying to steer, not even a lot, just a little, it's a terrifying experience. Now, it is reasonably comfortable in here. You do have a fairly large interior, uh, single-seater, but still large enough for a single person to sit in uh, and have no problems with legroom, knee room. Headroom, of course, is absolutely huge. This thing is not at all exciting, <laughs> except in the sense that it's kind of terrifying to operate and use. There is a charm to it, though. Like, you have this ridiculous vehicle that nobody else has, and frankly, it, but, it, but it's so ubiquitous. Like, everyone knows what this is, but no one's ever driven one or been in one. And it's kind of, there's like kind of something kind of charming about that. And it's, it's not so bad to drive. Now that I'm kind of getting used to it and getting used to the way it accelerates and the way that it steers, it isn't really so bad. I think the issue is high speed steering. You really don't want to be going any sort of speed and have to rely on just the front wheel to steer this, especially in the rain. Truthfully, I don't feel as unsafe driving it now as I did when I first set off. It's not that bad, but it's not good. And the steering really is like incredibly squirrely and scary at any speed. I guess you'd get used to it, but I'm constantly thinking of the Top Gear Reliant Robin segment where the cars would turn over. That's what this thing feels like, except even worse engineer. Also, one drawback of three-wheeled cars, obviously including this one, is you can't avoid bumps. You know, you see a bump coming up on the road. In a normal car, you can kind of steer around it. Not in this thing, because you have a wheel, a wheel, a wheel. 
So you got you end up kind of hitting everything. You don't really have a choice. This is not the kind of car you want to buy. And the owner told me people do buy these. They buy them in like Portland and the Bay Area to have them kind of like ironically as like a cool little thing. I wouldn't even want it for that. The only way I'd buy this is if I was just using it for very short trips just to make people laugh. And it certainly would do that. And so that's the Go4 Interceptor 2, also known as the Meter Maid car. This isn't particularly fast or exciting or attractive or well equipped or frankly very desirable at all, but it is incredibly quirky and I have always wondered what this thing would be like. And in case you have wondered too, well, now you know. And now it's time to give the Interceptor 2 a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 25 out of 100. And this is a huge deal because the Meter Maid car officially ties the BMW i set up for the title of worst car I've ever reviewed. The Meter Maid car, or I suppose I should call it the Interceptor, even though it couldn't intercept much more than a stray dog. The Interceptor is uncomfortable, impractical, slow, dangerous, and lacking in any decent equipment and luxuries. Naturally, therefore, I think it's wonderful. I've always wondered what it would be like to drive one of these, and I'm thrilled that I'd finally gotten the chance chance to spend the day with one. The speedometer goes up to 120 miles an hour, which would have been a standard speedometer for a Hyundai vehicle from this era, but not for a meter made car. The standard speed for a Hyundai from this era. This is so stupid. Okay, okay.